Pygmalion and Galatea, Part 5. In the weeks that followed, the inwardly turned and brazen Galatea tried to overturn Pygmalion's narrow-minded little residential cove around. She would always strike and sound many intuitive notes that had lain dormant within him since childhood. But after a brief chime of revelation had sounded, he would always slump back into the slime and mud of his unoriginal and orthodox ways. After some time, he found himself agreeing with her for the sake of contentment. At night, they would both lie in bed, kept awake by each other's brain noise. She would embark on soulful soliloquies, which sought to convince him of master plans and predetermination, and he would secretly scratch at his flesh under the bed covers as if her words were healed scabs that could readily be picked off and discarded. Her voice steadfast became the echo of his trials and tribulations. One morning, the brain noise overwhelmed him in quite the same way that a violent cascade might override in silence fluttering sounds issuing from more tranquil modes of being in a tropical rainforest. He had to put an end to the noise, the chaos, the warped visions, the madness that was Galatea. He had to finish off what he had started, unravel what he had knotted, destroy what he had created, for it threatened to overhaul his entire universe. He had to commit a sacrilegious act of uncreation. He hadn't the slightest notion of what the consequences might be, but the mental pain had become so excruciatingly unbearable that he hardly cared anymore. Pygmalion wheeled the clay statue to a rocky precipice in graveyard silence. He was fearful and excited at the same time. He thrust his hand inside his Calvin Klein undies and squeezed his prick which inflated rapidly like a life raft. If it were pitch dark he would have flung her to the ground and raped her to relieve the trauma and anguish forced upon him by her antics, but he didn't dare. There was no telling what prying eyes might suddenly veer out from a sharp corner or a grove of trees and stun him. Instead, he rubbed himself against her backside and expressed regret for what he was about to do. He quickly surveyed the steep drop and set Galatea directly in the line of fire. But before he could incite the fateful shove over the edge, she stepped out from her lifelike shell, glaring at him with scorn. So, this is what it's come down to. I thought you loved me. Trust me, I don't want to, but you leave me no choice, he yelled, spittle flying from his mouth. It's either you or sanity, and I'd rather have my sanity. Do you think getting rid of me will solve your problem? Asked Galatea. Your problems have only just started. You'll destroy me if I let you live. I'll come back and haunt you, she said. I'll drive you insane, Pygmalion. You can't, he said. You'll die the moment your body shatters at the foot of this cliff. You're a feeble and weak man, she barked back. You're unreasonable. The word is sensible. Not quite sensible enough to listen to the truth. It's madness. It's the future, she said. It's fate. Destiny. Call it what you will. Yours ends here. I am without past, present, future or destiny, she said. Oh, really? You drew me to yourself of your own accord, and now you're spitting me back into the whirlpool, she said. You can't handle me. You can't handle my words because they strike too close to home. Too sharp a chord in your intuition. You're a coward, Pygmalion. Bitch. You're gutless. Whore. You're a pathetic excuse for a man. Demon. You're as good as dead. Say goodbye, Galatea. Say goodbye, Pygmalion, she said because you're coming with me. You think so, do you? Heed my words and you will be rewarded. Love me, listen to me, and you will be honoured. Shatter me and you will destroy yourself. Pygmalion stepped forward and drove a kick into the wax statue, but found that he couldn't retract it. The frantic attempts to free his limb from his forsaken companion were futile. There was an undetectable force connecting the two together like a giant magnet. Sensing his urgency, it tightened its hold further. Pygmalion was flung along the gravel like a ragged doll, gaining momentum until he was airborne. He anticipated hearing his own screams as they tumbled through the air. They never came. The fall was like a muted scene, ear splitting within his head, and dead silent outside it.